Hi everyone and welcome to the long-awaited video about Mediator and CQRS. So if any of the words that you see on the screen seem interesting to you, then make sure to watch until the end. I think you're going to like it. Okay, so first let's start with CQS. So CQS, which was first invented by this guy over here, originally only talked about methods. So basically you have two kinds of methods. Ones that change data, manipulate the database, or change the state of the object. If so, then they're called a command and they're not allowed to return a value, so basically void. And the other kind of methods do return a value, they ask a question, but if so, they must be pure, and they're not allowed to change the state of any object. Okay, so let's look at an example. So over here, we have the definition of some stack, and let's look at these methods. So push, it's easy to see that this over here is a command, so it receives a value, it changes the state, but it's void, it doesn't return a value. Peek, also, it's pretty easy to see that this is a query, right? It asks the question, what's the top element? And it returns it. Okay, now looking at pop, what is it? Is it a command? Because it changes the state, right? It pops the first value. Or is it a query, right? It returns the value that was just popped. So the original definition of CQS is very strict, and this method doesn't have a place in the CQS world. You know, me and you aren't the only ones that think this definition is a bit strict. So both Martin Fowler and Greg Young both talk about the fact that this is a bit strict and not always practical. The pop example is actually taken from Martin Fowler. And that's why Greg Young came up with CQRS. So Greg Young also likes the separation between the commands and the queries, but what he sees as more important is having clear boundaries between what manipulates data and what doesn't manipulate data. And that's why he puts an emphasis on splitting the logic to two different classes or two different objects, one which manipulates data and one that doesn't. Okay, so going back to our stack example, so basically we would have two separate interfaces, one with our writes and one with our reads. Okay, the way you separate it is basically you always ask, am I changing data? If yes, then it's a command. Otherwise, if the method only reads data, then it sits over here in the read object. A very common misconception about CQS and CQRS is that this design pattern talks about the entire application and you need to have two separate applications, one for reading from the database and one for writing to the database. Or another misconception is that you need to have at least two databases, so one read database and one write database. So if you go back to the original documentation of the people who coined the terms, then you'll see it has nothing to do with separate applications. Of course, these design patterns that now we're looking at them in the micro level of a class can be taken to a macro level, and then we can look at it also as an entire application, how we can split it, but you aren't required to do any of that. So today I want us to take a non-trivial example like the authentication service, which has the register and the login methods, and ask ourselves how we would split it following the CQRS design pattern. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so I'm in our authentication service where we have the register and login methods. So let's start with the obvious. So register is obviously a command. We're adding the user to the database. So let's go ahead and change this to authentication command service. Let's update the file name as well. Then in the authentication service, then the implementation as well. Let's change it to command. Okay, now we want to leave the register method as part of this service. But what about the login method? So basically the login method has two parts. It checks if the user is in the database. And if he does, then it returns a new token, which the user can now use to authenticate against the service. I like asking myself, am I actually changing any data? Am I mutating any state? And since over here, we aren't, so the login method is actually a query. We can call this instead of login, maybe get token or get authentication details or a name that makes it more clear that we aren't changing anything. But it makes sense to put it in a query service. That way, whoever needs to use the login method has a clear boundary that he's only retrieving data and he's not also updating data. Okay, so let's go ahead and create also the query service. Okay, to make things a bit clearer, first of all, let's change the name of this file to authentication command service as well. Let's create here a new folder. Let's call it commands. Let's move both of these files inside. Next, let's create here a new folder. It's called queries. And for now, let's copy paste these two files over here. Then from the authentication command service, Let's remove the login method, both from the interface and the implementation. And in the query side, let's search for everywhere wrote command. 
but let's switch it with query. Let's update the file name. And let's do the same thing also over here. Great, let's remove the register method, both from here and from here. Let's update the file name to query. And that should be it, right? So we have the command folder with the command service and we have the queries with the query service. Great, let's create a new folder with anything that's common for both of them and move the authentication result inside. And last but not least, let's update all the namespaces to match the folder structure. So both over here, here, and here as well. And next, let's go to the dependency injection and make sure both of our services are registered. So this is the same, only that command should be query. And back in the authentication controller, let's change the name of this to authentication command service. And we'll also have here the query service. So the same thing just with query. Let's include the namespace and add it to the constructor. Let's just wrap the line so it's visible. Okay, now the register uses the command service. And in the login, we want to use the query service. Great, let's build a project and make sure that this works. So .NET build. Great, let's run the service. Okay, register command works successfully. And from the previous video, if we try to register the same user again, then we get our error messages. So let's make the login request. Let's just fix the password. And great, our login query works as we expect. Okay, so let's look at what we have. So all we had in the beginning was a single authentication service, which we split into both the command service and the query service. And I want us to think together how the solution will scale. If you've ever worked on a large system, then you know that sometimes these service files can become 7,000 lines of code of every developer just saying, yeah, I think it goes over here and adding his specific logic. So instead of having a single file, now we'll basically have two files where each one of them is also a God file. If you experience something like this, then you might like the next approach that we're going to take, which is splitting the application layer, not by these various services, but rather by the features or use cases that we have. So let's see what that might look like. Okay, so very similar to what we had before. So we have our commands and we have our queries. But instead of having over here the various services, what we have is we'll have the various features that have to do with authentication. And what this means is that as our application grows, it grows horizontally with more and more isolated features instead of growing vertically and that means a single file with all of our logic and all of our dependencies in one place. Okay, now I want us to zoom out actually and look at our system as a whole. So in clean architecture, as we discussed, the presentation layer is the door to the outside world. So in our case, in the request flow, then it's the controllers, it's the endpoints that we have translating the data that we get in the request to the language that the core logic of our application knows how to speak. And the response flow, so it's taking whatever answer the application layer returns to the presentation layer and converting it to the appropriate response. Okay, now focusing on the application layer, we want the application layer to have the use cases in our system. One of the reasons that I really like this approach is that it plays really nicely with clean architecture. So you look at the application layer and it's very obvious what the use cases of our system is. So two years from today, when this application has many features, then you can look at the application layer and it's very easy to see which use cases we have and what resource or what category they belong to. So this brings us to the next part of our video, which is using the package mediator. And the way this will work is we have our authentication controller sending either a command or a query to the mediator. And the mediator will invoke the appropriate command or query handler based on the command or query that we pass it. Okay, so if you aren't familiar with this, then this will make more sense as we implement it. So back in our application, let's add the mediator package to the application layer. So dotnet add to the application layer, the package mediator. Great, now that we have that, we can go to our controller and add the mediator interface. So private read only, I mediator, mediator. Great, let's close the terminal. Okay, now this mediator will replace these services that we have over here, so we won't need them anymore. 
Okay, and the way this works is that over here in our presentation layer, all we need to do is create here some command. Yes, yeah, so this doesn't exist yet, but let's imagine we have something similar to this and send this to the mediator, right? So something like this. Then the mediator will invoke the appropriate logic and will return the appropriate response. So let's look at how something like this is implemented. Okay, so over here in the application layer, let's create a new folder. It's called authentication inside command and over here, a folder register. Here, let's define our register command. So register command, so public record register command. And what we want to put over here is, yes, actually that this seems right. Let's just wrap it. Because I actually want to open side by side the register command and the register request. And you can see that in this case, they look exactly the same. This won't always be true. And all the command is, it encapsulates the data that we need to execute the command. So in this case, it's exactly what we got in the request. Okay, so now back in our controller, we can include this. And you can see we get here an error. That's because how is the mediator supposed to know that it returns this value? So back in our command, we need to define the return value. So I request error or authentication result. Let's add this. So complete definition is this is the data that we need. And this is what this command returns. Okay, so back in the authentication controller, this is actually synchronous. So let's add here await. And let's fix the signature. Great, now let's add the handler. Let me just close it so it's more organized. So authentication, register command. Let's create here the register command handler. Which, yes, let me just get rid of all of this actually. Let's include what we need to include. Error or, yes, and let's implement the interface. Yes, let's just put this on a new line so it's more readable. Okay, so all we have over here is the command handler, which as you can see, implements this interface from the mediator package, and it receives the command that it handles and the response that we're returning. Okay, now to handle this, let's copy the logic from the register method. So let's copy everything over here and paste it over here. Next, let's copy the two fields that we need and paste it here as well, and let's include everything we need to include. Great, next, let's create a constructor. Yes, thank you. Okay, next, the details are coming from the request, right? So let's change the name to command. And over here, let's have command, first name, last name, email, and password. Same goes over here for the email. Okay, and last thing, let's make this synchronous. And that's it. Okay, so again, all we have here is the specific dependencies that we need for this command handler. And down here, we have only the logic that we need to register the user. Let's do the same thing for the login logic. So queries in here, login, and in here, let's have the login query and the login query handler. Let's copy this entire thing and paste it over here. This, instead of register, will be login. It will receive only the email and the password, and it will return the exact same thing, yes. Let's just fix the namespace. Next, let's copy the entire handler and paste it over here. Let's actually just change every place where it says register to login. Okay, this is the login query, and this doesn't work because, yes, this should be query. Great, let's get rid of it, this entire thing. I'll let it generate the correct method for us. Then we can go to the query service and copy the entire login logic over here. Add async, change request to query, and get the values from this object. And that seems about right. Let's go ahead and get rid of this entire services folder. And back in the dependency injection, let's get rid of this and these two. And over here, we want some magic, which knows how to wire everything together. So services.addMediator and pass it our assembly, which is dependency injection. Okay, now this isn't recognized because it comes from a different package. So let's add it, .NET add to the application layer, the package mediator dot 10. Let's see if it can complete the entire thing. No, Microsoft dot dependency injection. Yes, 
perfect. Now let's add it. You know, if you're curious how this actually works. So over here, you can see that there's some logic that scans the assembly and connects everything together. So this is specifically the interface that we implemented. Now, Mediator has many really cool features and we'll actually cover, I think, almost all of them in the series. So if you're curious about notifications, behaviors, and so on, then make sure to subscribe because by the end of the series, then you should have a very good understanding of all the features that we're going to cover. Great. So now that we have everything wired together, let's go back to the authentication controller and get rid of these using statements. Yes. So one thing I did, which I shouldn't have done, over here, I deleted the authentication result object. So let's recreate it. So common authentication result. Yes, only that this should be capital. And let's add what we need to add. Right back over here, let's add the namespace and fix this here as well. So this comes from our new definition. Same goes over here and over here. And last but not least, over here as well. Great. Now let's replace this with our mediator implementation. So mediator.send. Here we want to send the login query. So query. Yes, the login query. Let's pass it over here and await the response. Let's fix this here. Okay, now one pro tip about the mediator interface. So if we look at the interface, we can see we actually have here two interfaces. The iSender has the send method, which we talked about, and the iPublisher is something else, which we'll talk about in the future. Okay, and because we really like the interface segregation principle, then we prefer not using the iMediator interface, but rather simply using only the iSender. So let's just replace everywhere it says iMediator with iSender. Great, now that we have that, let's just make sure that it builds as we expect. Perfect, let's run it. Okay, now I actually want us to put a breakpoint both over here and over here, and also in the corresponding handlers. So in the register command handler and in the login command handler over here. Great, let's attach the debugger. So F5 and let's choose our application. Okay, now that we have it attached, let's make the register request. Okay, we hit the breakpoint. We mapped our request to the corresponding command. Okay, let's continue. And we can see that the correct handler was invoked like we expect. Okay, let's make sure that the login works as well. So we make the request. We arrive at the controller. We map it to the corresponding query. And we see that the correct handler was invoked here as well. Great, let's continue. And here we have our response. Okay, now one last thing I want to talk about. So I want us to look at the login query. So you can see over here, we're returning the authentication result. Right. And in the authentication result, we're returning here the user object. Now, this user object is a domain entity, and we'll see in the future it's actually going to be one of our aggregates. And it's important to note that one of the main motivations for CQRS in domain driven design is to have the response as slim as possible. So, to have a slim DTO which contains only the data that I actually want to return from the query, and not like we're doing over here, where basically we're loading in the future, an entire aggregate, which probably has a lot of data and it encapsulates a lot of logic that we don't care about in the query flow. Okay, so that's just one thing to note, but I'm going to leave it as is for now. So that's it for this video. I really hope you understand the rationale behind this design choice and why even though it adds a layer of complexity, this might be something to consider in your applications. In the future videos, we'll talk about some other pretty cool features of the library Mediator. And we'll also start talking a bit more about domain-driven design principles, which we'll see how everything plays really, really nicely together. So if that sounds intriguing, make sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.